we're just going to jump right back in to, I put the passes up here that I had mentioned earlier because there are uh, several different scholarly views. And when I say that, I mean, you know, if, if, kind of a peer-reviewed kind of thing of what this pure language of Zephaniah chapter 3 verses, verse 9 is all about. I, I'm a big evidence guy. And uh, because my Bible uh, tells me that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So this traditional teaching that, well, if we have evidence, what do we need faith for? Which is actually a very common teaching in America. Well, if you have evidence, you don't need any faith and so forth. That's not biblical faith. Biblical faith is based upon the fact that there, God has given us abundant evidence in the universe. And he's just as sure about the physical evidence, the things we can see, as the things that we can't see. And so the things that we can see are revealed by the things which we can see. That's the whole point of them, if you will, because we can't see them. And so the reality is that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And I know that because, let me just give you one example. Remember, I'm full of stupid examples. Remember when I told you that earlier? I watched, uh, I was here early enough that I watched almost every one of you come in this room. Uh, I, I wasn't getting personal or anything. Just trust me, okay? I watched everybody come in, and every one of you came in, in the room and did the exact same thing. As a matter of fact, uh, after all these countries and all these lands and so forth, everybody always does the exact same thing. Every one of you came in the room, and you just plopped right down on a chair. Every one of you did that. Not a single one of you picked up the chair, made sure all the screws and nuts and bolts in place, and the seat was glued down right. Now, the reason why you did that was evidence the reason why you trusted the chair even though and the same is with me I walked in this room I've never met this chair in my life this is a totally strange chair I've never I have no idea what it's capable of doing to me but I've sat down in enough chairs in my life and they didn't collapse out from under me that I just sit right down so it's evidence that I can trust the chair. I remember uh, in a state called Ohio in the states a couple of years ago as soon as I made that statement an elderly man in the front row's chair completely collapsed <laughs> out from under. And it was, it's, it's funny in hindsight, but it was, it was, actually he was very elderly and it was kind of serious at the time. And then when we finally got the man up, he walks over to the next chair and he picks it up and he looks down and I said, do you know why you're doing that? And he says, well, I don't know. He says, because now you have evidence that you can't trust every chair. And so... That's what trust is based upon the evidence, not the other way around. And we need to teach that to the next generation. The next ge generation needs to understand that our father is confident of the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and all the things he created and all the ways that they operate. Because everything in the universe operates according to the laws of God. And when they stop doing that, everything falls to pieces. That's why in America, we started out in this country several hundred years ago when all of those festivals that we do now were actually against the law in America. When the, when the pilgrims came over to America, William Bradford and the bunch, William Bradford was teaching Hebrew. He established Hebrew universities in America, Harvard, so on and so forth. And we didn't have any of these things. And gradually over time, they came back into the culture. And gradually over time, in the last 50 years, America is always in the top five of all the immoral things that you can think of. We're always in the top five whether it be pornography, abortion, uh, legal drugs, illegal drugs, suicide, particularly among our young people, 17 years old and younger, murder. Now, not mass murder, just killing each other off one person at a time. We're still in the top five. Uh, prescription drugs, health costs, and guess what else we've always been in the top five in? Churches, seminaries, Christian rock bands, purpose-driven congregations, and so on and so forth if you will. We've always been in the top five in those as well. Does anybody see something wrong with this picture? You should. Okay, why? Because many years ago, we tossed out the commandments of God by saying things like, well, Jesus freed me from the law. When the Bible, not only does the Bible never say that, it never implies such a thing. That's something that does not exist in the Bible. Everything works. The biggest problem, of course, is the confusion of thinking that keeping laws save you. So I want to make this disclaimer right now. We are saved by grace through faith only, period. When Yeshua hung on that tree and shed his blood for us 2,000 years ago, he said, it is finished. 
And they took his body and they buried him. And where I put it in a tomb and so forth. And that's good. But it's not very good. Why? Because if he didn't rise from the dead, <laughs> okay, then he can't reproduce life. So that's the way a seed. That's the reason why all of Yeshua's parables, which we're going to talk about this afternoon, all involve a field and seed. When you can see how plants and things go in the ground, then you can see all the things that Paul said, particularly in the book of Galatians. You can understand all the things he said based upon the natural things of creation if you relegate it to simple theological ver views versus other theological views, views. You'll never come to any consensus about what Paul said. Because there's just as many scholars with PhDs on one side saying that, you know, that Paul did not speak against the Torah as there are those with PhDs on the other saying Paul was against the Torah. We never get anywhere and so forth because we're arguing theological concepts versus theological concepts. And we never, we never solved the problem. And so I believe that the Father's taken us back to the beginning. So there's the, there's the uh, passage that I, uh, that I mentioned earlier. When I was in Bible school, there were four fundamental views taught. I, this, this is 30-some-odd, whatever years ago it was. Um, and so I don't know um, how many of these four are, are taught these days. The number one view when I was in Bible school of what that pure language was was English. That was the number. Now, by the way, all four of these views were supported by scholarly work, so forth. Uh, the second view back then was French. I hope I don't mean to insult anybody, but every day I get up in the morning and get on my knees thanking God it's not French. Please, God, don't let it be French, okay? I know I insulted somebody here. I don't mean to do that, okay? The third view was speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Fourth view has always been the same, Hebrew. Hebrew has always been one of the four views. Now we can, so once again, I am an evidence guide. So I want to give you one of those evidences before we, we move on. In the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there were men in this world living in Europe, Theodore Herzl, Eliezer ben Yehuda would be two examples of that, who were meeting together with other Jewish brethren, if you will, in the first Zionist conference, the second Zionist conference, the third Zionist conference. This is in the early 1900s and the late 1800s. And they were having discussions and making decisions on creating the nation Israel that we know today. And that's what these things were all about, discussions on how this would take place. The reason why we're having these discussions is because most Jewry, Jews, living in Europe at that time, if you read the autobiographies of the people who were involved in it, did not want to create the nation Israel. And the reason why is because they were flourishing in Europe. They were doing quite well. And they were, as a matter of fact, they were reading things that Mark Twain said when he went to Israel, come back and saying, this is the most God-forsaken, dry, dusty land that I've ever been in my life. Who in the world would want to leave the luxury and the success that they were having in Europe and go to some dry, desolate land, okay, in the Middle East? And so most were not on board with this at all. And so therefore... When they came to making decisions on what would be the name of this country, Israel was not number one. Israel was number three. The number one choice, Palestine. Now, that's not hard to guess today. The no number two choice, Zion, or we would say Zion. Number three was Israel. The national language of this country back then, because every anthropologist, every linguist, every historian considered Hebrew to be a dead language. It was declared dead many centuries ago. And so why in the world would you have a dead language be the national language of an entire country? So Hebrew was number four on the list. The number one contender for the national language of Israel, German. Now that was based upon logic and evidence, by the way. Okay? I know at first glance you're going, what? This is before World War, War II. This is when they are living in, in countries in which they're speaking a combination of Hebrew, Ivrit, High German, and about ten other Romantic languages and so forth called Yiddish. And they were happy with that. They didn't want to learn a new language. They was hard-pressed to get Hebrew to be restored back in those days because they, the Jews were fine speaking Polish and, and Czech languages and so forth. They were fine with that. They didn't want to learn a whole new language. And so, therefore, German was the logical choice because of its combination of Hebrew and the language called Yiddish. But for some reason, World War II changed their mind. I don't know why, but some people got together after World War II and said, well, maybe German won't be 
the national language of our country and so forth. And so what ends up happening? Hebrew, considered to be a dead language, is now the national language of an entire country and spoken by millions of people, including some people in this room, all over the world. The dead has come back to life. Now, I want to make another uh, claim here, just in case there's any confusion about it. I believe that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, was the manifestation of the Word of God in the flesh. I believe that is with all my heart. When I, when I put E equals MC squared up on the board yesterday, I showed people in the laws of physics how that's a no-brainer and so forth. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that Yeshua was the Word of God. And that word of God is made up of this beautiful language, which I believe is, he's restoring. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the word of God, Yeshua, was once alive, dead, buried, and rose again the third day. And this beautiful language of our Bible that makes up the word of, Bi of our Bible was once alive, then dead, buried, and now it's risen again precisely on the third day. Because if it's a day as it's a thousand years, and a thousand years as it's a day since Yeshua hung on that tree, we have now entered into the third day, if you will, and now it's a national language of an entire country. That's just one of the evidences that this is the only language which any linguist on the planet will tell you has come back from the dead. No other language has come back from the dead. And so that may just be a coincidence. But that, the purpose of doing this is so we can see both the Old and New Testaments from one particular language. And that helps us to understand the things that we're going to talk about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be nothing but Paul uh, all day long. And we're going to talk about two words tomorrow. And I'll just tell them to you in advance in case you want to do a little pre-homework, if you will. Halakha and Agada. If you don't know those words, you will know them tomorrow because Paul's letters and Paul's writings are going to be from an Agadic point of view not a halakhic point of view. And if you don't know that, then you misconstrue what Paul was saying. Not to mention taking things out of a field. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Once again, the meaning of every single word in your Bible is in a simple little picture like this. A house, a family, and a piece of land. Not these things, but a house, a family, and a piece of land. Understanding the Bible through these things have gotten us nowhere. Going back to the way things were. That's what restoration, that's why Elijah's ministry was the ministry of restoration. When you take a Cadillac and put it in a field, if you're going to restore it after time, you don't get a Volkswagen. If, if, if it started out as a Cadillac and you restore it, what do you get? A Cadillac, not something totally different. Now, the reason I say this is because I live in a state. My wife and I are not from Utah, but we live in Utah in the United States, which is the home of Mormonism. And according to the Mormon religion, they're restoring, okay, what things used to be as well. But nothing they do is reflective of the way things used to be in the beginning. So they've taken a Cadillac and they've restored it and they've come up with a Mini Cooper or something. Okay, don't you have Mini Coopers here? In the? Okay, all right. They come up with something totally different. They're using the same words, but they're coming up with something totally different. And so the idea of restoration is to bring it back to where it used to be. But when you're restoring a house, for example, when, uh, when, when you move into an old house or you buy a house and it's kind of dilapidated and it's falling apart and so forth and, and you want to restore it, you may want to add some rooms over here. When you go to restore a house, sometimes there's things in that house you don't want to tear down. They're pillars. When you go to restore a house, sometimes there's some pillars that if I take that p thing down, the whole house comes down. So you say, I want to leave that pillar there. The fact that Yeshua is my Savior and my Deliverer and my Redeemer and He died on that tree 2,000 years ago, that's a pillar. I'm going to leave that there. The idea that I'm saved by grace through faith, no act upon my own, that's a pillar. I'm going to leave that there. There may be some other things, oh, that's not true, I want to tear that down. So that's really what this is all about. If I could just compare it to a house, is that we're restoring this house, some things you know, we're going to tear down and, and, and rebuild a new room there or whatever. And other things we want to leave there because they're a major part of the foundation of the house. Because the Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So the foundation has already been laid in the beginning. That's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3. So everything is revealed in this picture. Now, why would that be important? Because no matter where you live on the planet Earth, you see those things. I don't care what country you come from, 
what part of the world you live in, what continent you're on. Everybody can relate to a house, a family, and a piece of land. Sometimes that'll be a mud hut, or sometimes that'll be a mansion, or whatever the case may be, but everybody can relate to that. Now remember, in order to enter the kingdom, you must become as a little child. So the reason why the Father put all the meaning in the words in, in this picture is because every child, if I took little five- and six-year-old kids all over the world and sat them down and gave them a crayon and a piece of paper, and I said, draw me a picture. I didn't even tell them what to draw. David, I just said, draw me a picture. Everyone would draw a picture that looks like something like that. Why? Because that's their life. That's their surroundings. That's everything they're seeing. And our God was smart enough to put the meaning of words in that. He was wise enough not to only give his word to Japanese banjo players. And the reason why is because there's not very many Japanese banjo players. And the reason why is because Japanese people are smart enough not to play banjos. Okay? But I hope you understand the, the goofy point. If he would have just limited it to just this certain group of people over there, then how can you, if you love the world, if you love the whole world, and you care about them, and your, and your Bible says that you wrote, says, if you obey my commandments, I will bless you, wouldn't you want to bless the people? How are the people blessed? By obeying your commandments. If they have no way to hear them, it's only restricted to a group of people over here, then how can the world be blessed? When the world is blessed by keeping his ways. And so we put it in something that every child can relate to. So there's where the meaning of words are found, not looking them up in the, in, in the middle somewhere or in the beginning somewhere, but going back to what they meant when they started. And I gave this image earlier, um, and I'm going to go ahead and give it now. To, to elaborate a little bit, I teach what's called the mountaintop meaning of words. That's just a phrase I coined and so forth. Because when we look out into the world and we see, we see valleys and mountains and rivers and we see the topography, the, topography, I'll get that word out, of the way things are designed, we notice that particularly where I live, where Carol and I live, in the mountains, that when the rain first comes down on the mountains, the Bible compares words to water. In the Bible, words and water... Words and bread, words and food are the same kind of things. The th so words are compared to the things that you need to live, especially water. The Bible says, my words are like water, Isaiah says. They come out of my mouth, they, they, they go down to the earth for what they were designed to do. My words will not come back to me void. They will accomplish what I set them out to do. Then in the New Testament, to give you a New Testament example, Paul says, we are washed in the water of the word and so forth. Out of your belly shall flow living Water and so forth. So the word's compared to water. So when water first comes down on the mountaintop, the water is fresh and pure and pristine and full of oxygen and energy. But when the words, I mean the water, starts to come down into the valley, people come along, men, and they dump stuff into the streams, and then they fish the life out of them, and then they dump stuff into them, and they fish the life out of them. So as it heads to the ocean, people are adding things to it and taking things away from it. People are adding and taking away, adding, taking away. Now, by the time the water gets to, like in America, the Gulf of Mexico, what's the water look like now? It's brown, it's thick, it's yucky. It's no good to drink anymore. Same water, the water that started on the mountaintop that would bless you and fill you with energy has now make you sick when it gets down to the bottom of the stream. But it gets worse than that. Once it mixes with the salt water of the ocean, now the same water that blessed you on the mountain can kill you when it gets mixed with the multitudes. That's why in Hebrew, the same words for multitudes are the same words for the seas, the oceans. They're compared to the multitudes of people. Once it mixes into the cultures and so forth, now... You take four or five, you don't drink or eat anything out in the ocean. You drink that, you're going to die if you're out there in a lifeboat. But the Father knows that because he's, remember, we all agree that he's smarter than we are. So the Father knows that. So he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, Coilette 1, verse 7, here's what it says. Now I want you to get an image in your mind, which would be a good place to have an image. I don't know why we say that. I was thinking in my mind, I hope that's where you're thinking. Okay? You weren't thinking in your knee, were you? Okay? That's always funny to me, especially in America. You know, you, uh, English language is, is a funny language, you know I mean? Uh, Hebrew can be in, in some ways, if you will. But I, I, like I'll go into a convenience store or something, or a grocery store, and I, I'll grab a cup of coffee and I'll set it at the counter. And in America, everyone that operates the counters always says the same thing. They'll say, is that everything? No, it's just a cup of coffee. 
I can't afford everything in the store. And it's just the way we talk. How, how about this? What's the difference between having a choice and having two choices? Okay, think about that some other time. We'll move on, okay? <laughs> the point being, I, I want you to think, get this image in, in your mind once again of a father, because I'm about to quote Ecclesiastes 1 7. A father's on the beach with his child, and the child looks up around the shore of the beach, and the mountains coming down into the lake or the ocean, and he sees all these streams and rivers coming down into the lake. So he turns to his father, now here's the passage, and he says, Papa, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. And then the father turns to the son, I'm still quoting, and he says, Son, from where the rivers came, they will return. So this is just one of gazillions of examples of the fact that the reason why God's word is cyclical is because what it created operates in cycles. Everything in the universe operates in cycles, including non-living things like planets and moons, <laughs> okay, and so forth. Everything goes through its past. Everything goes through its cycles because that concept in Hebrew is to make a cycle. The Bible does not teach linearly. You can't understand the book of Revelation from a sequential point of view, and so forth, because he teaches in cycles. And so, with this in mind, the Father knows that that's what's going to happen to his word. So here's what he says. Here's what he does. He says, I will cause that water in the ocean to evaporate up into the clouds. The clouds will distill that water, which is one of the reasons why Yeshua is going to return in the clouds, which is another whole study. And I return that water back to the mountaintop, fresh and pure, ready to be able to drink again. So through every generation, the Father reveals His Word in cycles. He says, I'm going to take the words that have become muddied, and I'm going to bring them back and restore them back to like water that first comes down on the mountain. So when we define words, because what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to take a bunch of words, and we're going to take them in their ancient form, and you'll see they're all revealed in the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and so forth. Okay, moving on. Even though everything in the Bible is revealed in that picture, we're taught that you can't understand words unless you use this method. So you look up the word interpreted in a Strong's Concordance or any sort of lexicon. It will tell you it's the Greek word methamenuo. It will tell you it's a verb. It's a participle. It's present tense, nominative case, passive mood. It's in the neuter gender and it's singular. And so you say to yourself, well, I'm a whole lot smarter now. I'm going to suggest you really don't know much more than when you started and so forth. Because, and here's the reason why, 99% of every, every single person that's ever lived since the time of Adam and Eve have never, ever seen anything like that. And I'm being liberal with it. 99% of people have never seen a Greek lexicon. They've never seen a Hebrew lexicon. But 100% of the people in the world who have lived have seen that. Now, John 3, 16, if you're, if you're God and you so love the world, which one of those things are you going to reveal yourself to if you really love the whole world? Through the things that everybody's seen or through something that rarely has anybody ever seen? So moving on, we're not going to do this. Why? Because I've chosen not to do that. Okay, Matthew chapter 17, 11 through 13, I want you to give some of these passages that I've been quoting. Yeshua answered his disciples and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and do what? Restore all things. If you go back and read the ministry of Elijah in the Tanakh of the Old Testament, you'll see that we are told that when Elijah comes, he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. He's going to prepare the way for the Lord. So then in the New Testament, we reveal that Elijah's ministry is to restore all things. So preparation for the coming of the Lord is what? Restoring all things. And it's because of these three simple words. I'm not sure if I wrote them earlier. Did I wrote, write the words, and men began? Was that this conference, or was that another country that I did that? <laughs> that was last night. See, I can't remember. If, if you follow these words in your Bible... These three words, they only occur in the first five cha or 11 chapters of Genesis. And men began. Do, the, do your own homework on that. Every time you see that phrase, chaos ensues. Chaos quickly follows that. Why? Because men are in a fallen nature. And the tendency of men, once they start something, within two weeks we find a way to mess it up. Because the reality is only God can create. We can't create anything. We only mess with things and make other stuff, but we can't create anything. Men are given the ability to do two things. Number one, make a mess of things. 
And number two, restore the things that we have messed up. That's what I tell you. I've, I've spoken in over 40 prisons uh, across the United States. And that's the first thing I let those prisoners know. I'm sorry, guys, but you can't, you can't create anything in your circumstances. But God, you've messed it up. But God has given you the ability to be able to restore what you've messed up. So we can restore things. That's the reason why Isaiah 58 verses 11 and 12 says that you and I are the repairs of the breach. That passage will come up later. You and I are the restore of paths to dwell in. We were not designed by God to sit on the couch watching American Idol, eating bonbons, waiting for the Messiah to zap us out of our tennis shoes. That's not what we're designed to do. We play a part with the Father in the end of days and what He's doing. And so Isaiah 58, verse 11 and 12 says that you and I, if you read it very carefully, there's going to be a generation that's going to come out of that generation that's going to build the old waste cities. They're going to repair the breaches, and they're going to restore the past to dwell in. My personal opinion, this generation behind us, this next generation is going to be doing this because I'm hoping and praying that the, that the next generation is a little smarter than we were because most of us in this room, if you're walking this walk, if you know what I'm talking about, you came into it somewhere later on in your life. We now have a generation that's lived for one whole generation now, uh, restoring, coming back to the Shabbat, coming back to the Sabbath, coming back to these things that have been taken out of our culture, and therefore everything goes down the pooper. Now, how many conferences you, have you been in where someone says the pooper? I hope that doesn't have some... Strange meaning in England that I just messed up. <laughs> okay. All right. So then he goes on to say, but Elijah is come already. So the first time he came as John the Baptist. So the, the reason why is because he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. So for 2,000 years, the Father's been preparing these for 2,000 years. Hearts. You always got to start with the heart. We're going to talk about that with, tomorrow with Paul. That's something that everybody loses the focus on because Paul's trying to tell you, his own brothers in the flesh, he's trying to say, you start with the heart. You don't start out here. You start with the heart first. You guys have, just like uh, Nadab and Abihu in the Bible, you've circumvented the brazen altar, the heart, and you've rushed right in there into the holy place and so forth by skipping the heart part. And so the fire that was designed to come down and consume the sacrifice came down and consumed them because they skipped the altar part where the sacrifice was. And so therefore, if you can understand it, John the Baptist started the whole restoration at the time that Yeshua rose from the dead. So it's no coincidence if you're the bad guy, you also know that every word in the Bible is revealed in a house, family, and a piece of land. So what does the bad guy do? He attacked, corrupts the family. If words are revealed in how people normally live, a mother and a father, I just learned this just a few minutes ago, a man and a woman, some of you may have figured out what I just learned a few minutes ago. I don't know why I didn't know this, but just like America, everybody's turning toward marriages now can be men and men and women and women and uh, a mix and match, I guess, kind of thing and so forth. And when that happens to your culture, you begin to lose all the prophecies, because all the prophecies are embedded in the way people normally live their lives. And the enemy knows that if he can corrupt the family, if he can teach people, well, it's a man and a man now, or a village or some kind of thing like that, we lose the whole purpose of a mother and a father raising the children. Because so, we can see what unity and we can see what life being very good is all about. We lose that. We also lose it when you corrupt our bodies. That's not just eating kosher or not eating kosher or clean or unclean or any of those things. Um... There are a whole lot of clean things that God has declared clean on this earth that have been corrupted as well. The weed in the field. I don't care if you call it GMO, uh, if you call it hybrids, whatever word that you want to use. The, the enemy has been coming in. Do you know about more than uh, 11 years ago now, I think it was around 11 years ago, powers that be in this world sitting around in their labs wanting to feed all the people of the world and so forth because the Bible was designed for you and I to go out into the field and plant the seed. And then we take care of that seed and we nurture it. And when it produces fruit, we eat the fruit. We take the seed out of the fruit and we plant it back in the earth again. That's the way things were designed in the beginning in a field. And that's why all Yeshua's parables are about a field. So when you corrupt the field, what do you do? You corrupt the world. Remember Yeshua said the field is the world. So if you corrupt one thing, you corrupt it. If you corrupt the beginning, you corrupt the end because the end is revealed out of the beginning. 
So if you're the bad guy and you know the end is revealed in the beginning, what are you going to set out to do? Corrupt the beginning. And how, what's the best way to do that? Convince a mass of people for 2,000 years that the beginning was done away with on a cross 2,000 years ago. We're New Testament Christians now. We don't need any of that Old Testament Jewish stuff. And so when you throw out the beginning, what happens? You get 50 different versions of the end, which is exactly what we have going in our culture right now. So I, once again, I propose to you that God is smarter than we are and knows that. So he says, in the latter days, I'm going to restore all things. That's why you're here. Because something, I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but something probably inside of you knows that something's wrong with the status quo. Something's wrong somewhere, and you're sensing something that the Father is doing. Um, and that's why I believe uh, you are here. That's why I believe we're all here, is to learn to do this thing together and to be part of, of something bigger than ourselves. And so... He's, he's, he's corrupted everything in our body as well. And, of course, finally corrupt the land. Remember the powers of be 11 years ago decided that if we take the DNA of a pig and combine it with the DNA of corn, we can produce a hybrid, something genetically modified, if you will, that will produce a very great pest-resistant crop. And we can grow more corn to ship in cans filled with chemicals and preservatives to more people across the world to slowly kill them. I don't mean to get too dramatic here, but we could do a whole thing just on the food thing. And the word is compared to food in the Bible. There'll be a famine in the latter days, not of bread and water, but of the word of God and so forth. And that's exactly what we see before our eyes because the enemy knows that the revelation of how things work, particularly in Yeshua's parables, is revealed in a field. So what does he do? He corrupts the field. And when you begin to change and modify corn 11 years ago, pretty soon, 11 years later, people really don't know what corn used to taste like anymore because it didn't happen overnight. It happened slowly, click by click, over time. I can tell you that many people have noticed that, for example, in America, that tomatoes don't taste like tomatoes used to take taste back in the 50s and 60s, was, which is the time, I think, post-World War II when everything went down the, here it is again, pooper. Okay, was right after World War II. And I, I, I think the whole hippy-dippy generation that I was very much a part of, long hair, you know, everybody's my brother, uh, so forth, uh, is, was the start of the finish, if you will. And so my generation is a major part uh, of the collapse of things and so forth. So the idea is to corrupt everything. I teach what's called agrobiolinguistics. Um, linguistics, of course, is language. That's where the word comes forth from. Bio is biology, agro is agriculture. Uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that the meaning of all words are found in a field and in your body. Now, the reason why God did that, once again, is because he knows that everybody has to take their body wherever they go. See how smart God is? He knew that I couldn't go to England without taking my body with me. So, therefore, he put the meaning of everything in something that I have to have with me wherever I go, so there's no excuse. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that the invisible things unseen of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made so pa father took the most important things which the unseen things are the most important things second corinthians 4 18 says the unseen is eternal the seen is temporary so the unseen things are indeed the most important things but th the father has a problem with us we can't see them so he reveals them in the things that we can see. So the enemy attacks those things. The most important part about this room is not the walls, not me. It's not that. It's the foundation. Most of, it, most of us take the foundation for granted. How many of you walked in the room and said, boy, what a great foundation this building has? There's always somebody that raises their hand and says, I said that. Okay. <laughs> I said, oh, I bet you did. Okay. <laughs> okay, the point being, is that we just take it for granted. We don't think about it anymore. But the reality is you remove the foundation. What happens to all the pretty stuff? It comes caving in. And so the foundation, once you manipulate and corrupt the foundation, the whole house comes in. So no matter how you want to build your house, if you will, if that foundation is not there, doesn't matter how pretty it is, doesn't matter how ugly it is, it's all going to come down. So the Father is restoring the foundation. 
rebuilding the tabernacle of David, Amos chapter 9, whatever words, they, there's a combination of words you use throughout Scripture that describe the same thing. So everything is revealed in the things growing outside and biological things. So let me give you an example of why this is so important. Let's go back to the wilderness, the days of Moses in the wilderness and the children of Israel wandering there. And the Father told them in the wilderness that if you obey my commandments, I will bless you. If you obey them, I will not save you. You're not saved by keeping commandments. You're saved by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, blah, blah, blah. So what are the commandments for? Just like anything in life is to bless you. What are the, what are the instructions of my father in my house all about? To cause me to be his son? No, that was done through no act of my own. Then why do I listen to my father in the house? Because when I do what he tells me to do, I get ice cream. I get, I don't know any other way to put it. You get blessed. Some, some kids are wise enough to realize, you know, when I listen to what my dad tells me to do, I get stuff. And the other kid go, ah, I don't have to listen to him anymore. I don't have to do that. There's a reason why you're grounded to your room every day. What's the, what's the problem here? Okay. Nonetheless, they're wandering in the wilderness, and he knows. And so, therefore, the Torah, the commandments of God, which are revealed in the word halakha, which we'll talk about tomorrow, the Torah was written in stone. Right? On the stone tablets in the wilderness. Now, stone is made of, of, of atoms. Stone atoms. Are you with me on that? We see them because they're surrounded by an electromagnetic field. This is some of the things we talked about yesterday with the young people. The reason why we see them is because that electromagnetic field binds all those atoms together. And so we see the stone tablets. But there's something about atoms, things that are baryonic, if you will. And that is, they can only be in one place at one time. So the commandments of God, which what? Bless you if you keep them, are in the wilderness only in one place at a time. And so when they picked up and moved, and how many times did they do that? Forty-two times they took up, picked up, it's part of our tour portion today, picked up and moved where the cloud went. And so the commandments were packed up in the ark, and they took it with them. And so you could go read the commandments, but the commandments can only be in one place at one time. So the Father knows, because he's smarter than we are, that one day his people are going to be divided because of sin into the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And they're going to be scattered throughout the, all the earth. Whoops. He's got a problem now. Because the commandments, which bless his people, can only be in one place at one time, and now the people are scattered throughout all the earth. How am I going to bless the people when the commandments are in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant is made of wood overlaid with gold, which means it's made of wood atoms and gold atoms. <laughs> it can only be at one place at one time. And not only is that true, but he's got an additional problem. Men, you and I, don't even know where that's at. That's the big conundrum these days. Where's the Ark of the Covenant? So not only can the Ark of the Covenant, containing the commandments, which bless you, can only be in one place at one time. We don't even know where that is. So the Father's got a problem because it's commandments that bless them. So the Father's going, what am I to do? My commandments can only be in one place at one time, and my children are scattered throughout the far ends of the earth. I need to think of something, something that all of my children have. What can I? I know everybody has a heart. That's it. I'll take my commandments and write them on their heart because nobody can go anywhere without taking their heart. Nobody really left it in San Francisco. And so, therefore, I, that was funny. I don't care who you are. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Some of you are going, no, that wasn't funny, Brad, okay? You only think you're funny, okay? Well, at least I'm entertaining myself, okay? And so he's got a problem on his hands, so he knows everybody has to take the... You can't live without your heart. So he says, I know what to do. I'll write them on their hearts. Same commandments. There's no shift in, in it, but I'll write them on their heart. Why? Because my commandments are in an ark in stone, and we don't know where that's at. Well, he does, obviously, but they don't. And so, therefore, he writes them on their heart so we can take them wherever we go. And so now we do things from our heart. Now, it used to be there's no piano here. It's sometimes nice when there's a nice piano, and I show people what I'm talking about. So I'll try to do it just by speaking of it. When I was young, uh, I took piano lessons, which is something that used to be very popular in America in the 50s and 60s, starting with the Beatles, the bunch you guys produce. Um, 
No, they are actually my favorite band. But starting with the Beatles now, nobody takes piano lessons there anymore, and everybody wants to play guitar. <laughs> okay, and so forth. And so you know, in those days, there was a little blue-haired old lady that came to your house and so forth, and you sat down with her, and it was the most boring time of my life. I hated <laughs> piano lessons. My mother had to bribe me with every conceivable thing you can think of to get me to go sit down with this little blue-haired lady and go, uh, so I'm looking at this little red John Thompson book. In America, they were, it, was, it was a little red book that you first, everybody first learned from. And you look up at the black notes on the white paper, just like the Torah scroll is the black letters on the Torah scroll. And I would look at those notes and I'd uh, and it was the most terrible sounding thing. I mean, we're in the middle of Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Beatles and the Hermans Hermits and all those kind of guys, and I want to get cool, you know, and so forth. And so I finished the red book, and one day I'm, uh, I'm waiting for her, and she's bringing another book, and while she's doing that, I sat down to the piano, and I played that song from my heart. And when she walked in the door, she freaked out. Because I was sitting there, I wish, see, if I did it on the piano right now, it would make so much of a difference to show you the difference between, they're the same notes on the same paper, but now I'm playing it from here, see? And in other words, what did I put into it? Life. I put life in it. We've been teaching that the Torah was done away with. No, the life in the Torah was removed. And now he has come and licked and walked among us, and he's put the life back into his words, and because He is in you, now you have the ability and power through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life to play it from the heart. Now, to do these things from the heart, because if you do them, you are what? Blessed. What happens to a country that throws them out? They end up leading the world and all the immoral things that you can think of. And so the Father has to restore all these constantly. Why? Because when men began to do something... Chaos ensues. The last occurrence of that is in Genesis chapter 11, and men began to build a tower up into the heavens, and you know what soon followed that. And so the Father's always having to restore His people throughout every generation. It's not just for this generation. It's been every generation. That's why we go th throughout the history of the church. You see all these kinds of movements throughout the history of the church and so forth. Um, of the uh, kielot and so forth, the, the assemblies. Now we're going to talk about the difference in the thinking processes. We're going to do this until we take our first break. Marcus, remind me to give, or to give me the five-minute uh, sign there. We're going to take a few minutes to talk about the thinking process because whatsoever a man thinks, so he is and so forth. And in the book of Philippians, we're told that let this mind be in you that was in the Messiah Yeshua. Well, I have news for some people. Yeshua did not graduate from Dallas Theological Seminary. Yeshua was not a Swedish Presbyterian and so forth. Yeshua was a Hebrew, thought like a Hebrew, raised as a Hebrew and so forth. And so the Father knows that He can get us to behave like Yeshua if He can first get us to think like Yeshua. And the Western thought is much different than biblical Hebrew or Eastern, Middle Eastern thought. It's a much different thinking process. Many of us don't realize that we're thinking that way, but it's just the nature of, of all of us growing up in our various cultures. But we're supposed to take the Bible into our culture. We're not supposed to take the culture and cram it into the Bible. We're supposed to take His view to the world and so forth. And so I want to talk about some of the fundamental differences. Hebrew is concrete where Western thought is abstract. I gave examples of that earlier. Uh, concrete words are birds and bees and flowers and trees. Uh, Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who sits not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the, seat of the scornful. For he shall be... No, no, I skipped to verse 3. For he shall meditate on the Torah of his God day and night. Verse 2. He shall meditate on the Torah of your, or the laws of his God day and night. And what will that man be like? He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose fruit shall not wither, leaf shall not wither, so on and so forth. Those are good concrete terms from Hebrew into English. They didn't substitute them with abstract words because you can go out and see what happens when you take a tree and you plant it by the living waters. So he's put it in something that everybody can see in the natural events. And so we use words. There's nothing wrong with abstract words. 
In a multicultural word, you have to use abstract concepts like love. As a pastor, uh, I, I, I don't know how many couples I've counseled as a pastor over the years. I don't know how many there are. I don't even want to guess. 100, 200, I don't, I don't know. 50, 70, I don't know. But no, nonetheless, it's always the same with every couple. When they're married and they're having marriage problems, it's always the same. It's communication. They're both using the same word and have two different meanings of the word. So the first thing I sit down, I, says, I said, hon, I would say that to the woman. <laughs> just want to make sure everybody understands where I'm coming from. I would say, hon, uh, you're using the word love and your husband's using the word love. Can you tell me your definition of love? So we get the definitions now because they're both saying the same word, but they have two different definitions of the word. And so this is the problem. It's always communication. It always breaks down to that. And so, therefore, there's nothing wrong with the word love. It's not a pagan word. It's not even necessarily corrupt. It's just downstream. If we had time, we'd take it upstream and, and break down the word ahav, which is translated as love from the Hebrew word in your Bible. Uh, we may do that later, depending upon uh, uh, time. And so the Father's bringing things back to their concrete form. Hebrew is cyclical. Western thought is linear. It focuses on timelines, which is just Darwinian thought. It's not a coincidence that Paul said that which comes first is natural than that which is spiritual. So in the mid-1800s, Mr. Charles, Dar Charles Darwin goes out and looks at the little birdies and finches on the islands and so forth and then produces Origin of the Species, begins to teach the evolutionary theory. What quickly followed on the heels of that? Dispensational teaching within the church, John Darby, C.I. Schofield, all of a sudden, we have dispensational thinking in the church right after that. Right after, and, and everything's based upon long, long timelines. We are taught in Western cult, thought that time is just an incredibly long line. And I'm, I'm just going to do a test here just to see because I'm going to face the same way you guys are, okay? Think, thinking this way, where is, if we drew a line up there, which direction is the past? Everybody point to it. It's always that way. You look at a timeline. The past is always over here. Where's the future? Over here. Okay. And where are we? About right here. Okay. And so everything in the past is always at the direction. Every time you see the phony Darwin ascent of man, where do the monkeys start? Where's the guy with the suit and a briefcase? Over here. Right? We're all, it's like we're Pavlov's dog or something. You know, we're all trained to look at time as being in the past over there. And all, everything over here, biblically, is separated from everything over here, generally by a cross right here in the middle. There's a cross here that separates us. And everything on this side of the cross is Old Testament, law, judgment, blood, guts, no grace, all that kind of stuff, right? And everything to the right of the cross is love, joy, peace, goodness, church, love, dove, all those kind of things, okay? And so we're trained, even the terminology, we separate at that point. Apostles start here, church starts here, when all those words appear in the Old Testament more than they do in the New Testament. Do you know there's more apostles in the Old Testament than there were in the New Testament? You know why that's true? I know this is going to freak you out. There's more books in the Old Testament than there are in the New Testament. Now, I say that to some people shock because people aren't used to, because people look up the English word apostles in a strong concordance, and it doesn't appear in the Old Testament. So therefore, there's no apostles in the Old Testament. They look up the English word church in the Old Testament. It doesn't appear in their strong concordance. So therefore, there's no church in the Old Testament. When the church actually appears more times than it does in the New Testament. But we're just not trained to think that way. So therefore, that is going to manipulate everything we read in the New Testament because of what we've done, of our misunderstandings or misappropriations of what the foundation is all about. And so, therefore, everything this way is always portrayed as fuzzy, like in pictures. You have pictures of people in the 1800s and the early 1900s. It, all the pictures are always fuzzy. They're kind of out of focus. And did you notice that there's no good-looking people in the 1800s? <laughs> I don't know if the rest of you noticed that, but, but I, just, I just went to the uh, Iron Bridge Museum and so forth, and I'm sure we'll go to a couple others, and you're looking at these old pictures, and I'm going, look at there, Carol. Everybody's ugly. <laughs> I mean, everybody's going... You know, so, and so, so they even make the people ugly. I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
But, you know, starting here, all of a sudden, everybody's wearing the same clothes, you know, Star Trek, that, that whole thing, on the right-hand side. And so it's always set. So we're already taught something that's based upon our Darwinian timeline in the first. In other words, everything's getting better as it goes this way, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. And historically, we know that that's not true. Nothing in the universe made of mass and matter, which includes you and me, operates that way. Everything is downhill plan. And so since the Father knows that, he has to keep entering information into the system to keep us from melting away with a fervent heat. And he always does that through his little people he calls a remnant. That's why Isaiah 1 verse 9 says, if it was not for that remnant of people, we would have gone up like Sodom. We would have gone up like Gomorrah. So there's always, so guess what, gang? I know you're th thinking, Boy, there's not very many of us, and I get a lot of criticism, and it's tough to live this life because everybody gives, it looks at me like I've got a third head when I start talking about the tour and things like that. But the reality is it's always going to be a remnant. It's never going to be the majority of, of the people. That's just the reality of the way it's, it's always been. And so, therefore, we're trying to restore the fact that God speaks, uh, speaks to us cyclically, not literally. Let me give you an example. In the B Psalm, chapter 23, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Now, you're reading the King James paths, which is automatically solicits a linear thought. You're walking down a path to a goal. Okay? That word in English is designed to get you to think walking down a path to a goal. But that's not what the word means in the language in which it was written. It's our goal which we would transliterate it this way, a goal, that is an ayin, that is a gimel, that is a lamed. All Hebrew words that contain a gimel and a lamed will have something to do with rolling something over. Rolling something over. So words, especially this is called a parent root. When you have the three, forget the, uh, the vowels. We're just looking at this. This is how you, this is how you transliterate the Hebrew letter ayin, for those of you who don't know Hebrew. So there's just three letters, a gimel, a lamed. Okay, now in ancient Hebrew, these three letters look like this. These three, three letters look like this. And this one looks like this. This is the way these letters would look in ancient Hebrew. Because the letters told you, or the pictures of the letters told you what the word means. That's the way it's designed. And so, therefore, even though we would put it in English like this, these are the ancient pictures. First, a couple of things I want you to notice. This is the Lamed, the L. It's the letter that means the shepherd staff. It's a letter that means to lead something, okay? So what does it look like? Looks like a shepherd staff. They write it upside down sometimes. Most of the, most of the clay tablets that we found with Hebrew written on it, sometimes it'll be upside, written upside down. It looks like a shepherd staff. It's just turned upside down. It means to lead, the gimel is the foot, okay, to guide, to walk, to push, and so forth. And what does it look like? A foot, but it's, notice it's a stick foot. <laughs> Not big foot, but stick foot. Uh, when, when people, when children draw pictures, they first draw stick pictures. So the ancient Semitic languages all were stick figures because it was designed to be understood by Children, and children don't start out drawing like Michelangelo. They draw stick figures. So it's not a coincidence that all these are stick eyes and stick limbs and so forth. This is the gimel, okay, which means to push and so forth or to walk. This is the eye. So what does it look like? Ion. The Hebrew word for eye is ion. So the Hebrew word is actually the letter itself. It means to see to, to, uh, and so forth. So it looks like an eye. And so that is the parent root. The reason why we call it parent roots is because it has three letters. Is it okay if we talk about this? Okay, I don't want to lose anybody either, but I, but I, 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 I want to get some people getting really motivated by understanding, oh my goodness, my Bible is so much more down to earth than I thought it was. Get it out of the clouds and so forth. And so there, we call them parent roots because once you get it down to these three letters, it contains all the information for the rest of the family. For example, I have six children. If you saw each one of my children in a different place in the world, you would never guess that they're related to each other, seeing them separately. But if you brought all six together in the room and set them next to the parents, 
the parent root. That's why we call it the parent root. Then you see, oh, I see where he gets his nose and she gets her eyes and he gets his hair from. Now you can see that they're all related because you see the parents, because the parents contain all the genetic information for the children. So that's why we call them the parent roots. So the parent roots is going to give you the genetic information to understand how all the children are related to each other. Now, when we get into words here after the break, after the next break, I'm going to give you an example of words using that very method to show you how the language is designed. It's a design language. It's not happenstance. And so, so we see what all these words mean later. I don't, I don't want to push too much uh, right now. But then those of you who are familiar with the language, I don't want to be too, you know, fundamental either, uh, if you will. So Hebrew is cyclical. It operates um, in cycles. So this word path in Hebrew is agol. Agol, guess what? means to make a cycle. Agol in Hebrew doesn't mean a circle. Agol in Hebrew means to make a cycle, which means this. This is the actual action of the word translated as paths, erroneously. Okay? It doesn't mean a path like we understand a path. There's nothing wrong with the English word path, but it doesn't mean what it means to us. It means to make a cycle. And to make that cycle so many times, you, make, you wear a little rut in the ground. So that's that Hebrew word translated as a path in Psalm 23, 3. To make it so often, you wear a little rut in the ground, and you don't even have to worry about what you're doing anymore. You automatically go on the path. Now, the where this comes from is actually a word that in ancient times, they would take a calf, they would have a threshing wheel to thresh the grain so forth and they would yoke the calf it's not a coincidence that one of the family words of the word for path is a calf we'll talk about that later the calf they would yoke to the wheel and the calf would push the wheel around after three days they wouldn't have to yoke the calf to the wheel anymore why because it created a little rut in the ground and no it did not vary to the left and it didn't vary to the right remember how many times the Bible says Follow my ways. Do not turn to the left. Do not turn to the right. This is all based upon his cycles, when which we teach them to our children. When they grow old, they won't depart from them. Oh, they may crawl up out of the rut for a while when they're teenagers and so forth and kind of go out and do what they want to do, but eventually they come back to that path that was laid down. That's why it's critical that we teach our children the ways of God because truly when they get older, they'll go back to this Cycle, not one way path. And so that calf would push that cycle, uh, the threshing wheel, around on a cycle like that and create a little rut in the ground. And there just happened to be a period piece movie I remember seeing in the, in the early 1980s in which a bunch of marauders and killers and, and so forth went into a village and wiped out all the adults. But they took the children back to their camp. And they took those young children and they yoked them. They took the calves off and they yoked them to the threshing wheel. This is what happens at the beginning of the movie. And at the beginning of the movie, there's this young man. You only see him from the, from the shoulders down. He's pushing the threshing wheel. Then you see him a little bit later as a teenager, and he's getting a little buff. Does that translate here in England? He's getting a little buff? He's getting stronger. Sorry, that's an American term. I guess. Okay? So he's getting, and next thing you know, the last scene you've seen is Arnold Schwarzenegger, Conan the Barbarian was the name of the movie. And it's, Conan the Barbarian pushing this wheel around and you see this big rut in the ground and he's not yoked to the wheel anymore. He's pushing it, pushing it by nature. Okay? And that's probably where Arnold got the idea, I'll be back. Okay? <laughs> I just made that up. That's probably not true. Okay? But, but the point being is that that's, that phrase right there is exactly how our Creator works. I will be back. Five minutes? Okay. I will be back. The idea is everything in the universe operates according to cycles. The cycle of life, the cycle of planting a seed in the ground, and it produces fruit, and you eat the fruit, and you take the seed, and you plant it back in the ground. Seed, fruit, seed, fruit, seed, fruit. If you maintain that cycle, then you understand the parables. When you understand the parables, you understand the end-time prophecies. But no, we relegate it to everybody's different theological opinions rather than the natural things of creation. So what Psalm chapter 23, verse 3 is saying is that Lead me in your cycles of righteousness. Now, I remember uh, about 25 years ago watching a PBS, that's the public broadcasting system in America, a PBS special 
on a Lubavitcher Rebbe by the name of uh, Menachem Sneerson. And um, he was considered to be the Messiah by the Lubavitcher uh, uh, sect uh, back in the 90s. Of course, he's passed away since then. Uh, but he was doing a little yeshiva. That's a little school. And I remember a young rabbinical student standing up in the middle of that school, and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, he says, what are our cycles of righteousness? And the old Rebbe looks up, you know, he's got a 19-foot-long beard, you know, the whole scene, the big gray beard draped across the table onto the floor, you know. And he sits at his table, and he says, well, that is easy. That is our Sabbaths and our festivals. And so what he was saying is, in Hebrew thought, you know the people that wrote the Bible, okay, the cycles of righteousness are his month, his weekly Sabbath, the new moons, okay, the seven feasts every year, those are his cycles. That's why they're called the Lord's feasts in, in Leviticus chapter 23. They're called the feast of the Lord and so forth because, they're, because all the things he's teaching about the end times when that cycle makes its final completion is revealed in his feast because his feasts are designed to be in harmony with the earth, the ground, the crops, because all the feasts involve planting something and harvesting it. It's called circadian rhythms. Some may, of you may be familiar with circadian rhythms. The reality is that things are designed in the earth to be in harmony with the people and so forth. And so you see these rhythms of the earth. Are, that's why he says to, to, to let the land rest. People have a Sabbath, the land has a Sabbath. People have a jubilee, the land has a jubilee. People have a tithe, the land has a tithe. And that's because they're all tied up with that. Now, what happens if you throw those out and we just replace them with any old thing? Then you get 50 different versions of end-time prophecies because his prophecies are revealed in the cycles that he gave us in the very beginning. Vish Mereh 